All right, round two. You stretch your legs, you good to go. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Keep moving on with chapter three. So, so far we did the demand part. Now we're gonna move to our second part of the equation, which is supply. Then we're gonna put it all together in the third part. Okie dokie, let's go ahead and get started. And let's get down to business. Supply. So for the next like half hour of your life, take yourself out of the mind frame of a person that buys something and put yourself in the mind frame of someone that makes something that you plan to sell, all right? So what is supply? At the end of the day, let's go ahead and break this down. There are three attributes to, to supply. Remember in demand, you have to have the money for it, you have to have a plan to buy it, and you have to want it. In supply, we also got a number three. Don't worry, I, I make it so it's pretty equal in between the two. That makes it real easy for you to remember, right? If, firms, if a firm supplies a good or service, then the firm, one, has the resources and technology to produce it, two, can profit from producing it, and three, has made a definite plan to produce and sell it. I don't actually sell any of the things that I make at my house, but I'm gonna to pretend to be a seller for the next like half hour just so I can use, use the examples. All right, so let's say I'm making my jalapeno jelly. I have the resources and technology to make this. Obviously, check it out. It's not even falling to the bottom or anything. That's, that's a real thick boy right there. Yeah, we got this, we're good. So I have the resources and technology to produce this jelly. Can I profit from producing it? Sure. It doesn't cost me much to make this. I can profit from producing this. And that means I have a definite plan to produce it and sell it. So if I had a definite plan to produce and sell this, which really I just produce and give it to my friends, well, let's say I sell it. Let's say that I produce it and I sell it for $2 a pop. Then I have satisfied the three pieces of supply, resources, profit, plan, okay? So resources and technology determine what is possible to produce. I am growing jalapenos out of containers in the back. I don't have any fancy machinery and I make everything on a stove top that has four burners. There's only so much that I can make with my resources and my technology. Now, if I had a giant production factory, I had lots of workers, I had the technology to be able to, instead of me cutting up the jalapenos with my hands burning for days, instead I have like a machine to do that, that'd be a different resource and technology. I'd be able to produce more or less, right? So these are things that we have to think about. But, <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Next is going to be the quantity supplied. So the quantity supplied of a good or service is the amount that I plan to sell at a particular price. If people will pay me $10 for this jalapeno jelly, that really doesn't take me all that much to make. I'm going to be like, oh yeah, cool. That's so much. Yeah, I'm totally going to do that. And then I end up making a bunch and selling it out because people are paying me a really high price. So when the prices are high, I want to produce a lot of it. When prices are low, maybe not as much. If people are only going to pay me a dollar for this, and it costs me about a dollar in supplies to make, I'm not going to make very much, right? I'm like, oh, I'll make it for a few people, but like, I'm not going, I'm not going to produce hundreds because why, why would I? I'm not really making that much of a profit off of it. So the quantity supplied at each individual price point is gonna vary depending on what the price point is. Notice that this is the opposite of demand. Now, with demand, when prices went up, I wanted less of it. Supply is the other side, right? If I'm the person selling, uh, when prices go up, I want to sell more, right? That's the law of supply. The law of supply is as prices go up, the amount that I want to sell of it also goes up. So in demand, prices go up, demand goes down or quantity demand goes down, right? In supply, prices go up, quantity supply goes down. Other things remaining the same. So the law of supply results from the general tendency of the marginal cost of production. To produce the first couple jars of this doesn't cost me all that much, right? I have the jalapenos for it, I have the, the, the stove space, but eventually if I start producing more and more, Let's say that I start producing like a hundred jars. Well, I'm I'm gonna need more more burners. I'm gonna have to like borrow someone else's stove, so I have two stoves going. Well, that's gonna be a price that I'm incurring. I'm gonna need more jalapeno plants, which means that's more of a price that I'm going I'm going to be consuming. I'm gonna need to spend more time away from teaching classes and instead in the garden. So that's that's money that I'm giving up right there. So the the cost of these goods and services go up as I increase more and more of it. That's kind of reflected in 
the patterns that I have. How do I, how do I say this clearly? My willingness to supply is going to be at the point where I can cover costs, right? For the first couple ones of these, it doesn't cost me very much. I have one plant in the back that doesn't take very much water and I have one burner on my stove top and I can do all of that. Yeah? Okay. But if I want to produce a lot, I'm going to need to get a second stove and I'm going to need to get more plants and I'm going to probably need a bigger backyard and I'm going to need people to help me and I'm going to need prices go up the more and more I produce of something. So if these first couple jars maybe cost me a dollar or two ingredients in time, okay, then I'm willing to sell it for a dollar or two. When I get to a hundred jars of jelly, by then I've hired three workers and bought a stove. I'm going to need to make more than that because my cost, the cost at that point is probably costing me like five or six dollars a jar. So I'm not going to be willing to sell it for the same one or two dollars. I'm going to have to sell it for more. The marginal cost of production goes up. As the marginal cost of production goes up, that means that I need to sell things for a higher and higher price. That also means when there's higher and higher prices, I'm willing to have more of it than I'm making for the purpose of selling. So much like the demand curve, we have a supply curve. And the supply curve is just going to show the relationship that I have. Why does my phone keep going off? Please stop. Show the relationship in between different price points and how much I'm willing to sell at that price point. So what does that look like? It looks like this. So with this, we have our supply schedule on the left-hand side of the screen, and we have our supply of energy bars in a graph format on the right side of the screen. Let's look at price A. Okay, let's go ahead and just mute this because, I don't know, I don't receive a text message in like two, three weeks, and then all of a sudden my phone was to blow up as soon as I'm recording. All right, so let's go for price point A. At price point A, at 50 cents, they produce zero. Okay, so instead of energy bars, just go ahead and cross that out and think that we're talking about like jalapeno jam. It cost me about a dollar in supplies to make this. So at 50 cents, I'm not, I'm not really matching what my cost of production is. So I'm not going to produce any. I'm not actually going to start producing any of these jellies up until the point where I'm making about a dollar for them because that's how much it costs me to make. So maybe at a dollar, I'm willing to make like enough for, for a couple of my friends. I'll make six. Well, let's say that prices keep going up. The market just kind of ends out that way. And instead of people coming to me, say, they'll pay me a dollar. They come to me and they say, hey, we'll pay you $2 and 50 cents for that jelly. And then I'll be like, wow, that's a better price than I expected. Okay, like I'll spend some time and make some more because that'll cover my cost to make more. Maybe I make 15 at that point and I start making more for people. So as price goes up, the quantity supply goes up. Notice, this is very different from the demand graph. The demand graph was downward sloping. That's how I always try to remember it. It's kind of as, as an alliteration, like downward sloping demand, downward demand. Um, supply is upward sloping. These just reflect the nature of the law of supply and demand. So this is upward sloping because the higher and higher the price on the y-axis, the more and more I'm willing to supply along the left x-axis. So there is a minimum supply price. Notice that I'm not starting at zero, zero, right? On this graph, I'm starting at about 50 cents. 50 cents, I'm still producing zero. My first real point is at a dollar. At a dollar, I'm starting to produce some. That's because there's a price where it's just too expensive for me to produce. I'm not going to make any money. I'm just losing money. If I'm selling these for a penny, I am losing money. I am not willing to sell them for a penny. There's a minimum supply price, and that minimum supply price is what my marginal cost is to go ahead and start producing these first few jars. Yeah? So the lowest price possible is kind of called the marginal cost. And the marginal cost goes up the more and more I produce because, you know, as I'm having to add in equipment and time and energy, this is going to start costing me more. So the minute marginal cost for that next jar goes up. It might cost me a dollar in supplies to make this one, but when I get to the 15th or 20th or 500th jar of jalapeno jelly, that's going to start costing me a lot more in time and investment and resources and money and, and hiring people. So the, the prices when they go up are when my, the amount that I'm supplying goes up, prices also have to go up at the same time or else it won't match what I need to make my minimum cost. So what changes supply? Notice this line can move both left or right much like demand can. Remember that 
quantity demand was moving along the line. Quantity supplied is also moving along the line. If I move from C to B, um, that's because prices have gone down, and if prices go down for what they're willing to pay me for jelly, then I'm gonna produce less jelly. Quantity supplied moves inwards, okay? So let's say that the price goes from $1.50 to $2.50. Well, then I'm like, wow, you're really gonna pay me that much money? That's great. So I start producing more. We go up and to the right. Yeah, yeah, everybody following me so far? Good. Now changes in supply means that we're moving the entire curve to the left or to the right. These are changes that happen for really a non-price reason. So we can think of lots of those. And they're gonna kind of go into six main categories. Okay. So the first category is going to be the price of the factors of production. So first, price of the factors of production, then the price of related goods, then expected future prices, then the number of suppliers, technology, and the states of nature. These are gonna be our six. Notice I gave you six for demand, I give you six for supply. I try to keep things kind of equal in this class. All right, so the first, price of the factors of production. Um, I'm tired of talking about jelly. Let's talk about apple butter. What goes into apple butter? Okay, we, we got some apples, um, we got some cinnamon, we got some nutmeg, we, we have a little bit of pectin so it doesn't all go bad. Um, we have lots of sugar, yeah? So there's prices for all these different factors of production. It's going to be in time, in opportunity cost of other things I could do, but it's also going to be in money. So let's say in this jar that I have $2 worth of apples and I have 25 cents worth of sugar, and maybe another 20 cents worth of spices. Well, because all of that together comes out to about, I don't know, 85 cents, I'm willing to sell this for a dollar or two. Yeah, yeah, totally, that makes sense. Well, what happens if instead um, there's a sugar shortage? All our, no, there's, there's a sugar shortage and there's an apple shortage. So the price of sugar to make this amount has gone up to about like a dollar, okay? And then um, all the apple trees got taken out by the bad storm. So apples, um, I could no longer have my own, so I had, to, I had to go buy some and maybe it ends up being like $5 worth of apples. Well, if we have a dollar of sugar in here and $5 worth of apples in here and 20 cents worth of spices, that comes out to like $6 and 20 cents, right? If it costs me $6.20 to make this jar of apple butter, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to produce more or less at each price that you, you give me. So I'm not, let's say that I can't really control the price that people are willing to pay me. If they're willing to pay me $7, I'm making less profit. I'm gonna really supply less of them, right? I'm making less overhead. Um, if people are only willing to pay me $3 and it costs me $6.20 to make this, Psh, I'm not making it anymore. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not wasting my hard earned time and money when I can't actually make back the price that, that of the different pieces for it. So as the prices of the factors of production, so the price of the land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, as those go up, supply will shift to the left or inwards. As the prices of the factor of production go down, I'm willing to produce more, right? Let's say that the cost of apples just goes to almost nothing. It's a really, really good year for apples. And the apples end up costing me like, I don't know, 25 cents. Or no, less than that. Let's say like five cents, just five cents of apples in here. Well, then at each, each price that you pay me, I'm making more profit. So at $2, I'm going to make way more money than what I would have before. At $10, I'm gonna make way more money than I would have before. So it's gonna push my supply curve outwards or to the right. I really hope this camera's going the right direction because I'm not, I'm not actually sure. So if I am willing to supply more at that price point then, because my factors of production are now cheaper, then, then we're moving outwards. So prices of factors of production matter. Price of related goods matter as well. So a substitute in production for a good, for a good, is another good that can be produced using the same resources, right? So let's say that I have the resources of my garden and my stovetop. And we're looking at jelly versus apple butter. I could make either one of these using about the same resources. Like the ingredients are a little different, but I'm still using the same resources to produce them. I have the same jars, I have the same garden, I have the same water, I have the same stove. 
what happens to how much I'm willing to supply of apple butter if instead people start paying me $100 per, per jar of jalapeno jelly. The price skyrockets for jalapeno jelly and people are paying me so much for it. Well, then I'm not gonna produce as much apple butter, right? The price of the related good has made it so that I'm shifting down my supply of apple butter and instead I'm going to switch to producing this related good because I can make so much more money off of it. Okay, well, let's say that we can also make one of two goods. Jalapenos become really unfashionable. Nobody wants to eat them and they won't pay for them. So the price completely goes down. Well, if, if the, the price is, yeah, no, if the price goes down for jalapeno jelly, I'm not gonna wanna supply a lot of jalapeno jelly. So instead I'm gonna use those resources to make more apple butter, right? So when there's substitutes in production, I'm going to end up switching to whichever one's going to make me more money, which can affect how much I'm supplying of something without there being a direct price change. Now there could be complements in production, things that have to be produced together. If I'm making apple butter, I have to have both apples and a jar. If the price of jars skyrocket, I'm not gonna produce as much apple butter, yeah? Kind of the similar to how we had it in the last example. Um, if everybody wants, Oh no, I dropped the peanut butter. Um, let me, let me, let me pause real fast. Okay, we're back. We have almond butter now. So let's say you want an almond butter and jalapeno jelly sandwich. Well, these are compliments in production. I kind of, I kind of got to produce them together because people want their sandwiches. So I got, I got to produce both. Well, if the supply of a good increases, because the price increases of the complement product, what does that mean? So almond butter, prices have skyrocketed for almond butter. I want to supply more almond butter. I'm like, yeah, prices are skyrocketing. I totally want to produce that. But people don't want my almond butter alone. They want my jalapeno jelly, my complement that goes along with the almond butter because they want their sandwiches. Well, okay. Um, well, if I want to sell a whole bunch of almond butter for a lot of money, but people are demanding jelly with it, that means I am producing a whole bunch of jelly. The price did not change for the jelly. It didn't, but I want to sell more of it now. Yeah? Compliments in production. Next is expected future prices. If I think, I know that in a real good year for jalapenos, everybody has jalapeno jelly. They're selling it everywhere at the farmer's market. So I might not want to sell as much now. I'm not gonna make a lot of money for it. But I know in January, everybody's going to be out of their supply and they're going to want to buy more. Maybe instead I stockpile this in my fridge for months. And then in January, when everybody's out of jelly and they're like, oh, I could really get some jalapeno jelly and prices are up because there's not a lot of people producing it, then I can come back and I can sell more then, right? So sometimes I might supply less now because I expect prices to go up later where I'm going to produce more then, right? So I might shift in my supply now because I expect that prices will be better at a better date. Uh, then next is the number of suppliers, right? Let's think of the farmer's market. You go to the farmer's market, there are 5 million people with bananas and apples and Brussels sprouts and jalapeno jelly. If I'm producing jalapeno jelly and my neighbor what, what is her name? Anne is also producing jalapeno jelly. And then the person across the street, Dave, is producing jalapeno jelly. And um, Sarah down the street is also, I'm just coming up with names now, producing jalapeno jelly. There's four suppliers. So there's only so many cans. There's the cans that we're producing. If six more people move into the neighborhood and they all want to make jalapeno jelly, then I'm not really changing my behavior. My neighbor's not changing their behavior. But now there's a lot more. Supply has shifted because more people are now producing this good, which is going to shift the supply curve rightwards if we have more people. And if some people decide not to produce it anymore, then it's gonna shift left without me changing my behavior at all. Fit this technology, right? Advances in technology create new products. This takes a while. Um, but let's say that instead of me having to, um, do the little jalapenos by hand and my hands burn and I'm miserable and I don't like it. Um, let's say that there's like some new machine where I just throw the jalapenos into it and it comes out seeded and wonderful and cut into pieces. Oh, nice. 
Yeah, if that technology changes, kind of my cost of production's gone down, it's also more convenient for me, I'm gonna to wanna to supply more at each price point because I can do it more efficiently now. Last one's the state of nature. Um, guess what? The weather really affects things. Uh, if it's raining, you're not gonna to go to outdoor yoga. If it's raining really hard, you're not gonna to go to the outdoor Bella Milano seating. If it's raining super duper duper hard, it's going to destroy all my jalapenos. That's going to affect how much I can supply. Right, so natural disasters decrease the supply and shift the supply curve leftwards. Really, really good years. So let's say that it was sunny, it was beautiful, all the peppers are happy, we have more than we've ever seen before, that shifts it rightwards. States of nature really matter. All right, so let's say that there was an advance in technology in the production of these energy bars that we talked about in demand. So when I'm supplying, at 50 cents, I'm not gonna supply very much. Once we get to about a dollar, I'll supply some, and then the more and more you pay me, the more and more I'll produce. But let's say that there's an advance in technology for energy bars. Um, I no longer have to wrap them myself. I can just send them down the little machine that goes Voop! and then we have a wrapped energy bar. That simple. Okay, well that advancement in technology makes my life way easier, right? So in that case, maybe at 50 cents, because my price reduction has gone down, because I don't have to spend my time doing this by hand anymore, I can just send it through a machine. Well, then maybe at 50 cents, I'm now willing to, to supply something. And maybe at a dollar, I'm willing to make more. Instead of six, I'm willing to make 15. At 250, maybe I'm willing to make 15, or I'm willing to make 27, instead of the 15 I was originally producing. Supply moves outwards. The entire line moves outwards. Okay, so there's differences in the movement along the supply curve. If we're increasing the quantity supplied, that means we're going up and to the right. That means that prices are going up, and as prices go up, so moving upwards, I want to produce more. So I move rightwards. Moving to the upper right along that curve is a change in quantity supplied. Let's say that prices go down. Well, if prices go down, I don't want to produce as much. So prices go down, quantity shifts to the left, we go to the lower left of being along that same curve, which is our decrease in quantity supplied. So what about a shift in the supply curve itself? What happens if the entire curve moves to the left or right? Well, this means that it's happening for non-price reasons. Changes in prices move us along the curve. Changes in anything else moves the curve. If we want to supply less, it moves inwards. If we want to supply more, it moves outwards. Whew, okie dokie, that was part two. The next one's actually going to be our long bit. Now that we've kind of designed the entire background of demand and our background of supply, we gotta put them together and figure out where the market equilibrium is going to be. So get up again, stretch your legs, because I don't want anybody you know having issues where, where they're, they're hurting because they are watching this for hours on end. Get up, stretch, drink some water. Water's good for you. I will see you back at Market Equilibrium soon. Okie dokie. Thank you. Bye-bye.